Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at an Explorer Scientific ED-127, a 5-inch F7.5 apochromatic triplet refractor at an amazing price of $2,000. You know, when I was growing up, you couldn't get this at any price, let alone $2,000. If you think that's a lot of money, try pricing an Astrophysics AP-130, assuming you can even find one. So first of all, we need to distinguish this telescope from the similar looking but much less expensive AR-127, also an Explorer Scientific's lineup. The AR-127 is an achromat, that is the lower of the two grades of refractors. Nothing wrong with an Acromat, I've owned many of them and enjoyed them, and in fact I happen to like that AR-127 very much. It's a 5-inch f6.5, interesting that the Acromat is faster than the Apo. But if you do have an Acromat, you will have to put up with the chromatic aberration, that is those little purple halos around bright objects like bright stars or the limb of the moon. In an apochromatic refractor, all of those colors stay put there where they're supposed to be, and it is a much cleaner, crisper, and whiter image. This is exaggerated for effect. It's not actually that bad in real life. So this ED-127 sits near the top of this line from Explorer Scientific, which includes the 3-inch ED-80, the 4-inch ED-102, and the monster 6-inch ED-152. This one's verging on big scope territory, and if you know your telescopes, these are instantly recognizable out in the observing field in silhouette or even sometimes in the dark due to their oversized dew shield. This is the only scope I know that does a dew shield this wide. Anyway, in addition to the large dew shield, it has a fully collimatable push-pull lens cell if you have to collimate it, a two-inch, two-speed rotating focuser, whoever did this checked off all the boxes. The only difference is the one you're going to get is going to have a carrying handle on the top. It has gone missing in this particular sample. I borrowed this one from my friend Mike. He has owned two of these, and this is probably the fourth or fifth one of these that I've seen. So they do sell this ED-127 in a variety of configurations, and it can get a little bit confusing. The version that I've seen the most often is this one. It's the sort of stripped down version, the so-called Essentials Edition, without the diagonal and without the finder. You can get this in the normal version for about $2,800, and it has an upgraded focuser, or you can get the really cool looking carbon fiber version for $3,300. Adding to the confusion, there have been two versions of this Essentials Edition. The newer version is said to have a much better focuser and other minor enhancements. So your first task, of course, is to get the telescope on a mount, and the selection of a mount is crucial with a good telescope like this one. I have this on my mid-sized AVX mount, and the person I borrowed this from said, try it on that mount. He has one of these also. He says it's not quite as evil as you might think, which I'm not sure is a ringing endorsement here. And I think the problem is with the 20 to 22 pound weight of this thing fully equipped is in between mounts. It's in between the midsize mount and something slightly larger. Me, I would want to see it on something a little bit bigger, but I trust this guy. He loves refractors. Go to Mike's house and he has an entire room filled with long skinny tubes. So I tried it this way, and I think his description was probably correct. It's not evil. It's usable visually. For imaging, I'd want something a little bit more steady. Even in the visual realm, though, I think I would want to see the legs fully retracted, and I wouldn't set it up in the wind. But yes, it was okay for up to medium to medium high power. Didn't move around all that much. But you know my biases. When given the choice, put it on the heavier mount. This is my Celestron CGE. It is a Lozmandy G11 class mount. No jiggles or shakes in this configuration. The only thing you want to caution you on something this big is the rig starts getting heavy. This is well over 100 pounds, and it's an awkward, cumbersome 100 plus pounds. A lot of the weight is up high, so if I want to move this thing, pretty much everything has to come apart. So astute observers and experienced amateur astronomers will notice a couple of things about this setup. First of all, the CGE comes with a Lozmandy D plate, that's the wider plate, and the scope is on the narrower Vixen plate. I do have an adapter in place so that I can use it on this mount. Second of all, you may notice that the tube is pushed a little bit 
up like this. Mostly when you see a refractor, you'll see the tube pushed you know, much more forward, sort of like your kid choking up on a baseball bat. And the reason for that is you have a lot of heavy glass elements in the front here. This scope is front heavy. The reason you don't see more expensive apochromatic refractors in this configuration is because their focusers are usually quite heavy as well. This one's a little bit more lightweight, so to get the correct balance, it's going to look like this. Okay, so optically, how does this look? Well, it's really, really good. The star test gives us nothing really to talk about. That's always a good sign. You can make a case that a 5-inch class APO, which is getting up there in terms of a refractor size, could be a case for your only telescope. After all, refractors are very good at lunar, planetary, and double star work. But at 5 inches, you're getting into that realm where you can start to go a little bit deep into that deep sky realm. The superior contrast of a refractor is something that refractor lovers just crave. It looks like you can just see forever into that deep, dark abyss. Diamonds on velvet. That's the look that people like to see in a refractor. So I've talked about this before, but there is a Galaxy M33, which is kind of a rite of passage for astronomers. You see this big thing plotted in the atlas, and it's also very near the Galaxy M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. So I think a lot of beginners say, well, I'm just going to hop over there because it's not too far away. And then you point the telescope where M33 is pointed in the atlas, and nothing is there. Well, the reason is because, well, yes, it is there, but it is spread over a very large area, and the contrast is quite low. There are some cases where you're using a reflector or a Schmidt-Cassegrain or other kind of telescope. You're looking right at M33, and you can see nothing. Sometimes, if you have good conditions and a good refractor like this one, even if it has less aperture, you can point it at M33, and because of the superior contrast of the refractor, it will show up. This leads some people to think that refractors have some sort of magical properties. No, it's, you're not going to break the laws of physics. It's just that the superior contrast of the refractor can make certain items stand out. Another example around here is the Owl Nebula, M97 in Ursa Major. For whatever reason, from my location here, that's a really difficult object, like much more so than its statistics would indicate. When I want to look at that object, I will usually take a refractor to look at it. So for imaging, I had a lot of fun with this thing. I used my ZWO planetary imager on the moon. It only covers that much of the moon, so in order to get a full mosaic, you have to take a picture of one section of the moon, move the telescope very carefully, and then sort of go down in a grid pattern, overlapping as you go along. Be sure you don't miss a piece, and then you put it together and you can get an image like this one. You don't really think of a refractor as a planetary imager, but what the heck, Jupiter was up and I had the camera out, so I caught this image of Jupiter. Those of you who are planning to do planetary imaging with this telescope should know that the focuser does not have enough out-focus travel to bring the imager into focus. You will need an extension tube. I don't bother buying extension tubes. I just take an old Barlow lens and I screw off the lens and what's left is a hollow tube. You can use that as an extension tube. Similarly, for deep sky, with my particular setup, it's a DSLR with an Astrotech generic field flattener on it. There is not quite enough out-focus travel to come to focus, and as a result, it, luckily the Astrotech field flattener has a long nose piece. You pull it out and then clamp down on it, and you can come into focus. So before we look at these images, astrophotographers are constantly writing me to remind you that astronomical imaging is hard. None of this is easy. What you're seeing here is the result of almost two and a half months worth of work. So with that in mind, let's take a look at some pictures.
Okay, so since we do have a relatively large refractor under review here, I thought this would be a good time to address this issue of size and weight. For whatever reason, telescopes always look bigger in person than they appear on video or in pictures. I'm not really sure why. I think it has something to do with the third dimension and the fact that there's a lot of glass and metal here that makes it subjectively a lot bigger than it might appear in a photograph. One of the most common comments I get from somebody who gets a telescope for the first time, I didn't realize this thing was going to be so big. So anyway, these are from my personal collection. They're all Takahashi's. A little bit hard to see here. This one is the FS60. That's the FC76, the Sky90, the FS102, and of course the ED127 under consideration here. So I do want to go back to that image of NGC 7331 for just a moment. This is probably not the most visually exciting image I've ever taken. This is pushing the limits of the scope and probably my imaging capabilities at this point in time. But that galaxy on the left, it's not that hard to find. You normally need an 8 to 10 inch telescope and dark skies to see that. That galaxy is commonly cited as an example of what our own Milky Way galaxy would look like viewed from a distance at that angle. But go off to the right and you will see Stefan's Quintet, and you'll see a sort of row of stars in between. So Stefan's Quintet is interesting. It's five galaxies altogether. It's one of the most studied clusters of galaxies out there. And there's some strange stuff going on there. I'll let you look that up yourself. We're not exactly sure what's going on there. But those are 14th magnitude galaxies. I would normally need something like an 18 to 20 inch telescope to see those. Those are showing up in a five inch refractor. Not bad. So do I have any complaints? Well, not really. This thing is really nice, especially for the price. If I had to single one thing out, it would probably be the focuser. Nothing really wrong with the focuser, but it's not quite up to the quality of the rest of the tube. And I did notice when I was hanging some heavy accessories off the back, you know, a big two inch diagonal and a big two inch eyepiece or a camera and a field flattener, the action wasn't quite as smooth as I've seen on other refractors. If you're using lighter stuff, you won't have to worry about it. And I noticed also when I was taking images, no matter how much I tightened down on the focus lock, there was tended to be a little bit of creep outwards and stars would go out of focus. As an example, the image of M16 here that you saw earlier, the stars are just a little bit bloated and compare this with this other image where the stars are pinpoints. And again, you know, I could have been doing something wrong, but I thought I tightened everything down. In any case, if the focuser bothers you, at the time of filming, Explore Scientific will sell you an upgraded focuser for $179. I think that's probably a worthwhile upgrade given the quality of the optics and the rest of the optical tube here. So there you have it. Really nice telescope at a terrific price. As someone who's always wanted an AP-130 or a Takahashi FS-128 or TOA-130 but couldn't afford one, this is a really attractive option. So I think the major concern, you know, maybe other than the focuser a little bit, is you, the observer. Are you the kind of observer that could use a 5-inch apochromatic refractor? Keep in mind the size, the weight, the cost, and the fact that you're going to have to get a fairly large mount for it. If this is too much scope, you can always get one of the smaller versions. The ED80 is the 3-inch, and the ED102 are the 4-inch. In most refractor situations, the 3 to the 4-inch is the sweet spot, just like a 6 or 8-inch is a sweet spot for reflectors. Anyway, pick the version that suits your needs and your budget. I don't think you're going to go wrong with any of the telescopes in this line. They're all fantastic. Anyway, I hope this has helped you to decide if a telescope like this is right for you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.